there's something special about homegrown players. It's one of those football truths that's easy to feel and hard to explain. Fans love seeing one of their own thrive out there on that pitch. A local prodigy that shares the same streets, parks and love for their hometown club. After all, it's one thing to kiss the badge, it's another thing entirely to mean it. In this series, we want to develop a greater understanding of what it's like to be one of those players. To do this, we're going to explore three things. Where they grew up, their hometown club, and the player's journey to prominence. This is one of our own. Our first episode takes us to the East Midlands, more specifically Leicester City. To better understand the player, you have to get to grips with the place that moulded them. Uh, some people, a lot of people come from places that are maybe nicer or maybe bigger or more populated than Leicester. But people from Leicester love Leicester. I'm not even entirely sure why, because there are arguments as to why you shouldn't love Leicester. Even without its rich football history, Leicester is a unique place. A 2011 census called it one of the most diverse places in the UK. Unsurprising, given it's home to the largest proportion of British Indians. I'd describe it as a salad bowl. A salad bowl with different vegetables represent different people, all living together in one bowl. This is definitely a place that champions variety. There's just people, of, people from all over the world of different beliefs and different religions. So accepting as well so you never really feel like you're out of place or or you don't belong you don't belong here you know i'd say one of the most obvious things is the multiculturalism of it like it's very diverse you could be in if you really wanted to be you could be in lots of different cities at once if you thought about it in a certain way there's so many different environments living in one city and it's kind of it, it sounds very stereotypical to say but it is definitely like a melting pot of cultures but one that works I saw this change in the 80s. I mean, in the 70s, it was just, you couldn't go out at night without being chased by a gang of white lads, skinheads and bother boys. The culture I followed that time was a football culture. It was called the casual culture. And we had one thing in common, that was Leicester City FC. And because of that love for Leicester City FC, the love for football, we all became one, one group. We talk about politicians, they never did it. Pop stars never did it. No religious reason didn't do it. This culture did it, broke down a lot of barriers. And because we had that love for Leicester City, it's sort of, you're not this, you're not that, you're not a black this, or you're not a, the P word. You're Leicester, you're one of us. Like, I don't know how it is elsewhere in England, but it's never frowned upon to just be yourself, you know. And I feel like people in Leicester respect you more for, for being like that. And it's, it's easier to do it because a lot of people can be embarrassed or ashamed of their culture because it's different. But I feel like in Leicester, everyone's different and everyone's themselves and, and people will just get on with it and it's not really a big deal. It's not particularly well known, like unless you know people who go uni there and you're from London, you ain't gonna heard of Leicester really until they win the league maybe. But even worldwide, like people know about where Leicester is or what Leicester is at least because they won the league. Like it's, it's a reference point. Oh yeah, they won the league. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. You must, be, you must be gassed about that. You must be happy about that. Anywhere you go in the world, if you turn me from Leicester, they'll know that. Recently, it became a historical city after local builders dug up Richard III. But as far as fans are concerned, there's only one king around here and that's the King Power. In recent times, Fox's fans have experienced a roller coaster of emotions rivaled by very few in world football. Um, Leicester City as a, as a football club has been a pretty strange one to support over probably my generation, so what, the last 20 years? Pre previously had a little bit of history. Well, I know they had because my dad just made me watch the videos. I mean, my first memories, proper Martin O'Neill era, you know, mid, mid late 90s. League Cup Finals. I remember I went to the then Worthington Cup Final at the Old Wembley. Matt Elliott scored two headers against Tranmere. I remember that. My expectation of Leicester was probably win some, lose some, stay in the division. People don't, people don't remember that we just built the, the King Power or the Walker Stadium as it was at that point. You know, we'd just been finishing in, in the top half of the Premier League. We sold Emil Heskey. British record transfer to, to Liverpool and it, it basically just went downhill for, for a number of years. Found ourselves in the championship, found ourselves in administration, didn't own the stadium for years and years. And then effectively what followed was about 10 years of just dull championship football. I was at Leicester at the time and we used to have to go watch most of the games. 
quite a young team and they were mid-table E in the champ. And it eventually ended up as them dropping down in, into League One, which ultimately ended up being pretty much probably the best thing for us. From the despair of being relegated to the third tier of English football in 2008, we drew with um, Stoke City on the last day. Goalless draw, relegated down to, to League One. Second best defence in the Championship, by the way, that season and got relegated into League One. To the dizzying heights of a Premier League title in 15-16. An achievement so unlikely that for one magical season, the 13th biggest city in Britain became the epicentre of the football world. Last night, must have been a dawn in my past life. I know exactly where I was. Um, it was 2-0 to Spurs at half time and I thought, well, that's it, Leicester will we'll somehow blow it, you know, because that's my, my emotions and initial reaction as a fan. You, you, you never believe that was ever going to happen. And I remember saying to my dad, I was like, fuck this, I'm just going to leave, I'm going to drive back, to the, it's not going to happen today. Now, obviously, Ezen Hazard scored that goal and you saw the scenes at Jamie Vardy's house. I was sat there in my house on my own at the time, which I suppose is quite sad. I, I turned on to the A1, I'm going down the A1, my girl's like, when are you going to be here? I was about 45 minutes-ish. My dad rings me like, they drew two all, we won the league. Rang my girl, I said, babe, listen, I ain't coming in it. <laughs> nice where daylight comes too soon. After party, everyone roll through. Don't matter where I go, as long as I go with you. I swear daylight comes too soon. Daylight comes too soon. I swear daylight comes too soon. After party, everyone roll through. But I just remember, like, I generally just dropped to my knees and I, I did, like, I cried and, and, and I sobbed um, the night when we won the Premier League. Drove as close as I could to the stadium, walked to the stadium. Weirdly enough, I seen my dad there, my dad was fucked. Yeah, and it was, like, the most together I've ever seen the city. That and the parade was, like, literally everybody in the city. Like, you couldn't move your car then. People just honking their horns, flipping, waving flags and that. Like, it was mental. All the years I lived here, born and bred here, I never seen that moment in my life where everybody was black, brown, white, able, disabled, male, female, elderly, the young, all got together to celebrate this occasion. It was fantastic. Never seen it before, but Ranieri did it. It was amazing, amazing high. Just for those few days, a few weeks, it was just great living in Leicester. I don't think I've ever seen Leicester like that, and I don't think probably will again. Clearly, this unprecedented success had a huge effect on Leicester, both on and off the pitch. Not only did it galvanise the fan base, but it propelled certain players to superstardom. Ultimately, this made it even harder to break into the first team. In the title-winning season, manager Claudio Ranieri only used 17 players in the first 22 games, with his preferred 11 playing 87% of the matches. In fact, in his squad of 23, only two stem from the youth ranks, with forward Joe Dudu playing just 19 minutes. In the following two seasons, the club spent £160 million on players as they sought to maintain their newfound status in the Premier League. However, even before the title win, the road to Leicester's first team wasn't a clear one. In the 11 years that followed the trophy-laden O'Neill era, the club appointed 12 permanent managers, with no discernible style prevailing. The days of seeing local talent like Shilton, Lineker and Heskey in the first team seemed like a long way off. There had been Sven Goran Eriksson and there had been Nigel Pearson, and there was a massive influx of new players and a massive overload of first team players so that there was players who were international footballers like for their countries who couldn't get in the first team because they weren't Nigel Pearson's players. So there wasn't a lot of opportunity to play reserve football. Therefore, going down a level in the under 18s, there wasn't much access to men's football. So like you weren't training with the men, there was a separate reserve squad and it just didn't work for me. Um, but that time there, probably if you ask most young footballers, who were professional, they look back most fondly on their days during their scholarship. Like, those people, you're with them every day, you're literally doing the thing you love the most. The thing you've always wanted to do since you were probably five, six. You build a real togetherness with those people, like everything you do, like you're the first ones there. You train, you do jobs, you do another training session, then you do more jobs and you're there till like five o'clock. So like, I don't think many people who come up in the professional game find people they're as close to in the game as the people who they did scholarships with. 
Much to the club's credit, the pathway to the first team is now much clearer, and the new philosophy has once again raised expectations on and off the pitch. Now in the 1920 season, there's renewed optimism that the Blues can be a force in domestic football once more. Manager Brendan Rodgers has mixed youth and experience to create an exciting side who are challenging the dominance of the top six. Amongst his prodigious young talents is Hamza Chowdhury, born and raised in Loughborough, a town of just 57,000 people. At the age of five, Hamza's mum Rafia took him to an open day at Loughborough University, hoping to expend some of his energy. It proved an inspired decision. The first time he went to football, it was, it was just amazing. As in, you could tell that was what he loved. You know, he was so excited. My uncle used to watch it a lot around the house anyway, so I used to sit and, and watch it with him before I really went to play it. So I kind of knew, <laughs> knew what to do. And... and literally the other kids, bless them, were kind of bouncing off him. And I was like slowly, slowly moving away from the other parents, <laughs> you know. When Hamza was just seven years old, his uncle took him to a football match for the first time. Football was fast becoming his everything. Yeah, I can remember obviously getting, getting outside the stadium and, and sort of smelling the bag van. You know, you get that little bit that so brings memories back. Obviously walking up the steps and into the, into the football stadium is it's something you can't really describe, you know. You have to almost experience it for the first time to really realise. By the age of 14, Hamza was turning out for the club's academy. And such was the commitment of his family, they moved closer to the training facilities to help the youngster realise his dream. You don't tend to think of them as sacrifices. You do what you have to do for each and every child. We used to, just each stage was, we just loved, you know, even that this thing of where he used to be ball boy. It was like, oh yes, he's a ball boy. We used to get excited about anything and everything. Obviously we had other clubs um, interested as well. The staff there that do, that made it really quite an easy decision. And the way the club makes you feel, um, you felt like it was going to be Look, well looked after. I think they also understood which was key to our background as well and obviously it is quite an alien environment to go into for, for, for us because we're not from a football background. I was really born in um, an Asian from my Bengali side of the family so I was really brought up with an Asian culture which is a lot of food and a lot of family so it was a, it was a perfect upbringing if you like. Uh, there was never a dull moment inside the house so it was nice. Knowing your roots and knowing where you come from does make life easier in the end. There are times where obviously everybody has it, you know, the cult, uh, culture clashes and all this stuff, but it makes you more confident in who you are, where you come from, what, you, what, what everything is about, and where you fit into everything. Where we used to go, especially in Bangladesh, we used to go to my family's house, which is a little village, so growing up in, in England and all the benefits and luxuries you get when you go over there, it's very minimal. Uh, I can remember the first few times there was still like pumping water from a well and stuff like that. So it's it's so grand and humbling to feel to feel lucky. Really, you just take a step back and you're like, what would I do if I was here? Because because in this day and age, you can't go five minutes without looking at your phone. But it really makes you realise how lucky you are to be in a position, regardless of what profession you're in. It's just the, the luxury of having food and water and clean clothes, stuff like that. And it definitely does have them. Um, a massive impact on your life because you, you kind of don't think, take things for granted and, and you enjoy every moment. By 16, he'd repaid his family's faith in him and was promoted to the Senior Academy, where he gained a reputation for fierce competitiveness and a fearless, combative style of play. However, before Hamza could don the colours of his hometown club, he'd have to prove himself elsewhere. A rite of passage is becoming increasingly important in the modern game. At 19, he went 40 minutes up the road to Burton Albion, who were then chasing promotion to the Championship from League One. Yeah, it was really good. It was um, a bit of a surprise, to be honest. Uh, so on a Friday, I was just chilling with my mates and uh, John Rodkin gave me a call. And uh, to be honest, I ignored it a couple of times. <laughs> and then uh, eventually I took it and he was at Ham's. Um, Burn really want to take you on loan. So I was like, yeah. To be honest, we'd just been talking about them through the week and how well they'd been doing in League One. They were top of League One at the time. He was like, look, they want you to go tomorrow and be on the bench. So I was like, okay. So he's like, look, just get home and get your head down and, and just make your way there in the morning. So it was a bit of a surprise to go there and, and meet the boys on a match day where they're all in the changing room already ready. And uh, I came on for, I think, like 15 minutes uh, to make my league debut, which I really enjoyed and will obviously cherish always. We got promoted that season, which was massive. I think I was 18 at the time, so to do that so early was a bit like surreal. You didn't really take it in at the moment. Like, I think when you do stuff like that early in your career, you feel like Stuff like that happens every every year, you know. But um, I can remember a few of the boys telling me that like, Ham's like, 
make sure you take this in, make sure you enjoy every moment because honestly it does not happen every season, you know. Went back on um, a second spell and, and really enjoyed it. I found it a lot tougher playing in the championship. I didn't really play as much, but still a massive experience that I think like obviously pushed me on and, and helped me become to play for Leicester. So you made your Leicester debut against Spurs. Did it feel like a long time coming? Like now is the right time? Uh, yeah, definitely. I felt I felt like now was the right time. I was still, I think, only 19 or just turning 20. I did still really feel like I was a young a, a young boy in the men's change room really at that time, especially because the the leap up between League One and Championship to the top ends of the Premier League is so massive. Do you remember standing on that touch line, that white line, when you're about to come on and hit the Yeah, yeah, it was a bit crazy to be honest. I just had to look around quickly before I got my top on and. And loads of just loads and loads of butterflies. It's just like this is happening and it's happening now. And then obviously once you cross the white line, it all fades away until the end of the game where your friends and your family are all messaging and, and you're getting loads of congratulations and stuff like that. And then you sort of, you don't get much sleep because you just like feel like, okay, now I've done it. I've done what I've dreamed to do, but I've got to push on again, you know. Uh, it was surreal. It was really surreal at the time, but amazing. Oh my God, it still gives me tingles, to, uh, tingles around my side. It was absolutely amazing because obviously you love it for yourself, but also for him because that's what he's always dreamed of doing. You feel the same emotion when Hamza does something on the pitch, when Harvey does it and when Ben does it. They've all grown up together and from a very young age and they've all had the same dream. I remember when Harvey came on, I was like, oh my gosh, you know, I, I was crying, crying, you know, it is, it's just lovely when all of the, any of them do anything like that. They've gone through so much together. All, you know, all the loans and ups and downs. Does it help being surrounded by so many other players? Definitely, yeah, because it can be quite nerve wracking. It can be quite scary going into that change room, not really knowing anyone. Obviously you do, you speak to, you speak to the first thing players in and around the change room, uh, in and around the training ground, sorry. But to have someone there like Chile when I first moved up made it so much easier, although, the boys were really good with me and really helped me help me settle right in, so it was nice. It's a different relationship. It's quite a... Um, because of the nature of the game of football and being at that level, it's it's something else that I think, I even as a mother, I can't really understand. I wouldn't understand because it's the whole culture, the whole... Everything when you're going through it is so different. And it's been, um, it's been wonderful that he's had that little group of friends. He's had Ben, he's had... Harvey there, you know, and the yeah, absolutely. In 1920, three academy graduates are set to post over 1,000 Premier League minutes for the Foxes for the first time since the club's promotion in 1314. But given that football is arguably more competitive than ever, our young pro still is attached to the idea of playing for their hometown club. I think one of the factors would probably be if you support them, if your parents support them, because a lot, a lot of the time. With whether they say it or not, a lot of players' motivations will be to A, make their family proud and A, make their family financially secure. That is the, the goal of it all, to be honest. The glory as well, but really and truly, that should be A and B. But going back to what you said about does it mean more, it would have meant a hell of a lot more to me. Like, I think about my dad's been a Leicester fan his whole life. I, it is more important. It should be anyway. If it's not, then you've got a glitch in you somewhere. I don't I don't know. Like I'm sure Jesse Lingard is more proud to play for Manchester United than he would be for any other club. I'm sure Hamza is, I'm sure anyone who plays for their hometown club, like the long staff brothers at Newcastle, I'm sure them, their parents, their whole family are even more so proud. Like they would be proud of them if they played for any professional club, especially a Premier League club. But the fact that it's my doorstep, this is where I was born, raised, bred, everything that should mean more, and I think it does, being honest. Hamza is undoubtedly breaking through at a unique point in time for Leicester City Football Club, where a willingness to blood young talent is becoming the norm, not the exception. However, his status in the game is far from normal, capturing local hearts and minds while transcending regional boundaries. Not only is he inspiring young footballers across Leicestershire, but also the South Asian community, who represent 7% of the UK's total population. I think it's very important to show the diversity of Leicester because Leicester, look, over a third of Leicester are Asian. I mean, it's great to see homegrown talent instead of buying players for millions and millions of pounds and bringing them in, which is good as well. It's good to see our own people from our own city actually, you know, coming through as well. It's brilliant. 
it gives it gives inspiration to other kids to want to be like that as well to you know do better for themselves think if these guys can do it we can do it so it's an inspiration for people to to say to me that I am a reference point or that they're proud of me for doing it for the Asian community is, is the best feeling ever obviously trying to be a role model for uh, a certain population of, of the country to go out and do what they love because it is in, in the South Asian community football is massive they love football so to, to be really I don't know tagged as that is, is a nice feeling. Despite that figure amounting to 3.5 million people by the end of the 1819 season only four professionals of South Asian descent had played Premier League football Chowdhury being one of them. Hopefully his emergence in this youthful Leicester side is the catalyst for positive change. However, for now, Hamza's focus is establishing himself in this team and the support he receives from his family and the wider Leicester community empowers him to do this. You know, you've got friends and family texting you before and of course you started for the first five Premier yeah. League games so you're you know, playing an influential part in, in the game and in the result. Does it make it that little bit harder to prepare? Because you're like, I'm going to face ramifications if you lose this game. <laughs> no, nah, not really. I feel like all my friends and family are really supporting as, as other fans, so not really, they don't really put any added pressure and I can really go and just try and help the team, team get the result. Clearly, Leicester City and its football club's strengths lie in its differences, from its diverse population to hungry young side. And who better to represent this diversity than the son of Bangladeshi and Grenadian parents, born in Leicestershire, who's been at the club since he could first kick a ball. I've always thought he would. If he's going to make it, it will be at Leicester. I would have been, I think you'd have knocked me over with a feather if it's anywhere else. <laughs> 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 <laughs>